Well, good morning and welcome to our town hall meeting. I'm Keith Merrill and we're glad to have you here today. Um, what we're here to do today is talk about the uh, a potential project that we're calling the River Club and River, excuse me, Golf Club and the River Club Sports Complex Project. So that's what we want to talk about. <coughs> Today's agenda. First of all, you're going to receive a strategic overview of the project and why we as owners should potentially consider this project. Following that, we're gonna talk about the project details and the estimated costs, and then how the cost of the project will be covered. Review the next steps in the process of this total process. And most importantly, re receive feedback from you. And we do want your questions and comments, but please hold off till we made the presentation. Otherwise, we'll uh, never get through it. So we do ask that you wait until the end, and we'll open it up for questions. Uh, Luke Goons, who is with the Strategic Planning Committee, is going to make the first presentation, and then he'll be followed by Jim Whitmore, our general manager. He'll talk about the project, and then I'll talk about how, to, how we're going to cover it. And one last thing is that today or tomorrow you will receive by email a survey. It's very simple, it's five, not five pages, five questions. And uh, it gives you an opportunity to make additional comments. So please, please return those surveys. We really would like to get all the data and input we can. So I'm gonna turn it over to Luke. Hi Keith. Thank you Keith, uh, good morning everyone. Um, I saw many of you already having a, a peek at the beautiful rendering that we had on the screen uh, before starting. Um, there's plenty more to come, uh, but before we get to that, I want to take some time um, to set a little bit of the context and try to explain the rationale behind the project, um, why we think this is something that the community should consider, uh, and how we got to this point. Um, uh, first of all, uh, let me just uh, introduce the, the Strategic Planning Committee. We, we are assisting the board uh, by keeping a close look on what's going on within the membership, trying to understand what the members are participating in, what kind of amenities you use, what you use more than in the past, what kind of changes you have in how you spend your, your days, um, how you spend your dollars, do you go to prefer, prefer to the river club, do you go to the former clubhouse, do you spend it on sports, do you spend it on something else? So we're trying to understand really who is our customer. Uh, and by better understanding our customer, we hope that we can bring a better product and a better um, offering of amenities. Um, but at the same time, um, we're looking around outside the community to understand what's going on in other communities, as also they are looking at what's best for their members. Um, and there's a bunch of new communities being built. Um, so for future owners, people that were, might considering retirement in Florida, coming down south, there's a lot of choice today outside uh, in terms of what kind of communities are out there and what they could pick. So we need to make sure we are dressed to play, uh, make sure we have a perfect offering to, to have a very compelling um, attraction to them. Um, we do that based on a lot of information, both information that we collect from within the community uh, as data that we collect from outside the community. There's a long list, I'm just going to highlight a few. Um, focus groups, town hall meetings, the annual owner survey, very rich in data. Uh, we turn it upside down, inside out, and we're trying to really understand the subgroups within the community on what you really like. Uh, but what also the areas are that you identify as mm, close to perfect, but not perfect yet. So we need to look for continuous improvements and how best we can do that and, and, and where we should do that in the community. Uh, we also do that for new owners, uh, new buyers that came into the community. Uh, we also uh, get a survey with them and we, we get feedback on why they chose us and what criteria they used, how they got to know us, uh, what other communities they looked at before they made their final decision. Um, all that kind of information, so about knowing ourselves, knowing what's out there from a competitive perspective, uh, benchmarking exercises, how we do on a lot of criteria. We compare ourselves to over 20 other uh, communities. 
Um, all that has been written down uh, for the first time in a comprehensive document, which is called the Strategic Plan. It's available on the website for anyone who would like to have a closer look. Um, and every year we, we make an update. We make an update of all the new things that we learn, uh, all the new things that we see coming towards us as we look forward into the future, uh, because we really want to anticipate um, the things that are potentially going to come up the, on the radar in terms of not so good for us, but also other things that we might consider opportunities uh, to reinforce our competitive difference uh, with uh, other communities. So every year we provide an update, we go back to the board um, to make sure that they are really current, what's, what the messaging is that comes from within the membership, but also that they stay current on what's going on in the marketplace and what the overall trends are in the market. So uh, in this kind of business, the hospitality business, standing still is not really a good option. Um, it's either we move forward with a market that is evolving as we speak all the time, um, or you go backwards. And backwards is not a pretty picture because that means slippery slope and eroding equity in our home values long term. So keeping up, making sure we stay ahead and we're looking forward is the, the kind of the big message. We did the last deep review earlier on this year and in February we presented that to the board and all the NVRs and basically the, the, the key messages of that you will find this in this presentation today um, and also incorporated in the concepts that we will present and what Jim will highlight uh, later on this morning. Um, we were joined by um, a selection of other members from within the community to make sure that we covered all different angles, uh, looked at all the different subgroups in the community, and that this really is a kind of a plan and a package that is really good for the community in its entire uh, format. So good for all of us. Um, Yes, we do spend a lot of time on doing research, analytical work, writing the strategy, uh, presenting the different options to the board, um, all of their pros and cons, uh, but all that only makes sense if you know where we want to go long term. And based on all the feedback that we got from the membership, um, a few years back there was a vision and mission statement formulated, and that reads like, we want to be the most desirable bundled community in Southwest Florida. So most desirable would be if people are coming and have a look around, we would like to be their first choice. Um, bundled community, we'll come back on that. We really opt for a fully bundled philosophy uh, in our community. Uh, and yes, and we do compete not only with communities who are close by, but communities uh, all the way here from here to Bonita Beach and down to Naples, east and west of 75, because prospective buyers who are still up north dreaming about a place down south for retirement, when they land at the airport, they don't come straight to us. There's a lot of places to visit, uh, and we just need to be conscious of that. Um, when you look at the description, uh, words like full service, fully bundled, resort-like amenities, uh, we want to offer a standard, high quality level through all the amenities. Uh, whether it's dining, golf, tennis, fitness, we want to have a one high quality standard. Not one thing is really good and another thing that we don't really want to show. So we want to make sure that everything in Pelican Sound is presentable in its best uh, format. Uh, at the same time, we're very conscious about how we manage the dollars, how cost-efficient and cost-effective we uh, use our dollars to make sure that we can offer the best value package uh, to our membership. So the best value on a door-to-door -door basis, the annual operating cost uh, budget that we have. Uh, so get the memberships the biggest bang for the buck in terms of experiences and amenities that you get compared to other communities for the same kind of money. Uh, on the website there's more detail, but the bottom line of it is that we want to make sure that we can maintain, enhance on a continuous basis uh, all the assets that we have in our community to bring the best possible experiences for our, com uh, for our members. And a big step forward was taken when we kicked off the River Club project a couple of years. And as many of you will agree, this has been a big wow and a big boost forward for the, for the entire community. Um, 
when you read a lot of these uh, industry reports and you read about other communities and what these consultants are uh, recommending to the respective boards of these communities, there's a big common theme that comes up. First of all, uh, each of these communities have a relatively sizable membership base uh, and it's critical for, for, the, for the communities to make sure that we can entertain, bring experiences and make sure that you're very happy, satisfied, uh, and that you want to start, want to stay as long as possible. So I call that entertain and retain as good as we can. Um, we want to have happy customers with high satisfaction rates, and at the same time doing that at the best valuable uh, package deal possible. Uh, while we optimize for ourselves as we're listening on an ongoing basis to the membership, uh, it's a fine balance also to walk and to make sure that whatever new assets and new capital we put in place, because that's going to last for the next 10 to 15 years, that we also make sure that we keep the criteria in mind that new prospective buyers are using to select what kind of community they prefer. So it's a good balance that we try to, uh, try to walk. Um, we get a lot of feedback from prospective buyers, whether they finally become owners in the community. Some of them that said, we looked at you, but we decided to choose another community. Um, so we get that kind of feedback, and it is words like wow factor when they come to the River Club, but it's also things like, hmm, it's a little bit dark, it's a bit tired, you can see this building is, what, 20 years old? Uh, com when I compare that to other communities that I visited. So we want to just have to have an open mind and listen to what uh, people from, when we leave our perfect bubble, a little paradise here, when we go outside, uh, some people come and, and provide us some feedback on what they think the real market is. Um, when we, we do a lot of these things pretty well, uh, and we get rewarded for that, and that's reflected uh, actually in, in the real estate values, uh, when you see at the equities and our properties and how that has evolved recently over the, over the last couple of years, um, Pelican Sound has done relatively well. We have done better than average than the market um, because some other communities have not done so well. So they, have been, they haven't seen that reward. Uh, so real estate values go up and down in function of how well communities are kept up for the long term. It's a critical uh, notion. Um, we choose for, for offering a, an all-in-one package. Uh, we're truly bundled. Um, we're all in this together. Uh, we're not a club that you say, oh, I like to do this, but I don't want to participate or I don't care about the other amenities, I don't want to pay for that. No, we choose clearly for a bundled concept and all together we facilitate for all our members that they can participate in all these different uh, amenities. Um, we have been proactively looking forward and investing on an ongoing basis, even if we just briefly look backwards and we look at the last five years. Uh, Pelican Sound has invested over $12 million, a combination of big projects and smaller projects. Just to highlight a few, um, upgrades on the shuttle uh, dock here, the kayak infrastructure, the boat launch, uh, things for the boaters. Um, Big other pro uh, project was the removal of the palmettos um, over two years. Uh, it's been really good for the playability of the golf course. A lot of golfers are happy that they can find their balls back. Uh, and a lot of homeowners are even more happy that they have their view of their golf course back. Um, and once again, it's reflected as you look and watch closely to what's happening with the property values that we have. First floor units have <coughs> gone up faster than second floor units in the community because that investment has already paid back big time for all of us. Um, the River Club, um, yeah, a new restaurant, we would say, but in the meantime, it has become a real social hub for the entire community. You really have to get early on Friday to get a parking spot, on Thursday to get a parking spot, and people just don't go for dinner and go back home. No, they stay around, they hang out with friends, they have a good social time. And at nine o'clock, we need to remind a bunch of people that we close, uh, unfortunately. Uh, but that's the way it is. Um, fitness facility, this building, if you still remember how it looked like a couple of years ago, was tiny, small. From last in class, today best in class, uh, this facility can be showcased and compared to any other community in our neighborhood. Uh, we're doing very well. And Mike downstairs, um, he's extremely busy running over 135 different classes. 
a month in season, that's pretty busy. Um, and even still, then, then there are still both male and female uh, members coming to him to say, can you add another yoga class? Can you add another stretch class? Can't you make the groups and the classes bigger? Um, so there's a clear sense and, and, and a messaging that our membership wants to have more of these fitness and also wellness focused um, programs going forward. So we do anticipate that demand. And at some point in time, Mike and the team, they're gonna come up to the second floor, use part of that space. So we need to be proactive and look ahead and make sure that we can free up some of the meeting room space here, relocate that to somewhere else within the community so that really this can become a truly uh, fully fitness and wellness center uh, for our members. Coaches, sports forward. courts, playgrounds, uh, kiddie pools, uh, all, all showcases or uh, proof that we, we listen to our membership and as our membership and demographics evolve um, we, we, we adjust the offerings that we have um, as we want to make sure that people that are now grandparents they can bring the grandkids and all that is like circle of life and we make sure that we as a community follow very closely what our membership wants. A um, couple of years back in some of the neighborhoods Pickabo started at parking lots uh, in the beginning, not sure whether that water would stick or not. Uh, it did. It grows fast. Um, we put up some pickleballs, uh, courts, but unfortunately there where we are right now, that's only a temporary solution because we're not even supposed to be at that part of land as FPL can knock us out any, any day soon. So we need to find a structural, long-term, good solution uh, to, to accommodate a growing amenity. Um, and last but not least, uh, golf is by far our biggest uh, amenity. Um, out of the 12 million dollars, last year two and a half million was invested in regressing the entire golf course. Uh, really big project, but also want to remind you of um, the upgrades on the short game, the putting greens, the chipping areas that we had added around the, the former clubhouse. So just <coughs> continuously a, a list of big and smaller projects to make sure that we can enhance um, the value uh, and the experiences for our members in, in the community. Uh, we have 1299 units in Pelican Sound. Uh, we are a busy community. Um, but it doesn't mean that we all do the same things and definitely need not at the same time. Um, just have like a quick look. Um, so 1299, it's about 2,500 members that live in the community, that are part of the community, and about 2,000 of them are actually active golfers. Okay. Uh, we double check the Chelsea system, the monthly member billing uh, system that we have. Um, and then actually it shows that 20% of the families in Pelican Sound do not play golf. Maybe a surprise for some of us, but the good news is 80% play golf and they want to play a lot of golf. Um, so the other 20%, they, they are busy doing other things. And as we have that long list of other amenities, you will see that there's a wide variety. Um, not everyone has a golf handicap of the golfers. Only 1,500 of us, of the members, have an active uh, golf handicap. Um, when you're lower than 23, you're in the better group. When you're higher than 23, those people don't care and have a lot of fun. Um, so uh, it's, a good, it's a good thing. But it just showcases that we have a wide variety of members from one spectrum people that play occasionally and a nine hole with friends uh, now we have people who want to play two, three times in the week, and now we have really good golfers who want to play even more. So there's a wide variety of uh, choices and what the memberships want from, from our golf infrastructure. Uh, food and beverage, um, 75, 80% actively um, uses the uh, food and beverage options that we have. Uh, but once again, um, Four or five hundred families spend maybe three, four hundred dollars on a year. In the middle, we have families that go in, in season when they're here, they go two or three times to either the, the clubhouse or the river club. And at the end of the end, 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 uh, other end of the spectrum, there are families who are really regular customers uh, and really love the bar at the river club. So, once again, it shows that it's an infrastructure. And the average Pelican Sound member, I haven't really met him or her yet, 
because we're all a little bit different and we all want different things out of the community and what we have to uh, offer. Um, Pickleball, uh, quickly growing exponentially actually, it's going to double uh, going forward. Uh, the tennis community is growing as well, a lot of the new owners, um, it's 400 homes that were sold over the last four years, about 160, 180 families joined the community. Um, it's difficult to get on the teams. Uh, the round robin is the only option for actually people that are new to play. If you want to play competitively and participate with the teams, today the teams are fully booked. And we can't add more teams because even today, the teams cannot all play their home matches that they're supposed to play at home. They have to play away from home. And that's why some people observe and say, hey, the courts are empty. Yeah, and that's because four courts at the same time are playing somewhere else because two teams, two leagues, can't play at the same time at the current infrastructure that we have. Um, Boche also growing, um, neighborhood competitions, but even we have a competitive team now that travels to other communities. Uh, the fitness, we, we talked uh, about that. Uh, the boating, kayak, the whole community around the river, um, and particularly the shuttle. Um, I would say the shuttle is the visual icon for all of us to say, this is Pelican Sand, and this is how we're different and unique. That's what the other guys don't have. Um, and yet, 30% uh, of us do use it. Uh, we all love it because we're busy on Monday I have my fully booked, on Tuesday I have my calendar thing, on Wednesday I have my thing to do, so when do I have time to go? But then when friends come and the family comes down and the grandkids come, then you need to get up early in the morning to get a booking if you want to take six people on the shuttle that day. Um, so it's a great asset, it's a wonderful uh, thing for us to have. Um, and it's one, it's one of the many. Um, now all that doesn't come for free. Uh, we pay annual dues uh, for, for that. We overall, we're very competitive. Um, but sometimes when we talk to, to members, um, sometimes we hear, well, I pay $6,000 or so to play golf. Well, actually, you don't really pay $6,000 for the golf. You pay for a lot of different things. And let, let's, let's have a quick look at actually what you pay for, for your annual dues. Um, almost 45% is actually property management, overhead costs, utility costs to run the club. These are the things like making sure that all the pools are clean, that the security is in place, that the Comcast uh, deal is working, uh, all that. Yeah? Um, and of course, Jim has to do all the things to make this club run on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, secondly, we all contrib contribute financially to two different things on one hand. The replacement capital fund, $850 per year. Um, it's like all of us writing a check for $850. We put it on a big saving account. And whenever we need to make replacement uh, items, we need to replace the heaters or air conditioners or parts of the roofs or whatever got stuck, uh, we use that fund to uh, replace these items. The second one is the $750 annual payment that we do for five years, the repayment for the loan that we took on to build the River Club um, facility. All that actually to say that out of our $7,020, only $2,300 is actually what we collectively together, what we pay to subsidize all the fun things that we do all day um, in the community. Whether that's golf, whether that's tennis, whether that's the fitness, whether that's the restaurants, the whole, the choice of amenities that we do have. Let's have a quick look what that, what that means. Um, actually, the big two big ticket items, and they are there it's structurally so for all these years, if you look back, uh, golf is, as I said, our biggest amenity. Uh, half of our amenity cost, cost go to subsidizing uh, the golf infrastructure. Food and beverage is the second biggest uh, item. So combined, these two items are more than 80% almost of what we pay for. Everything else um, is relatively small parts of that, uh, that ticket item. Uh, when you have a closer look, uh, $1,280, that's what we pay uh, for golf. It's the difference between all the costs for maintaining and making sure that we have a perfect golf course to play on and the revenue that we get from the, the golf carts uh, and the annual uh, fees that some people pay. Um, whether you're here on a permanent basis or for multiple months, and actually an interesting stat is 
only 30% of the community stays here less than six months a year. The majority, so 70%, is here for more than seven months, more than six months a year. And the big, the big bulk is actually between six and eight months. That's where the majority of all the members are actually what they spend in Pelican Sound. So often we hear, well, the season is only three months long, and in reality, majority of us are using all our infrastructure and amenities for six to eight, nine months. And then we have a growing, a growing group of people that here are, are here on a quasi-permanent basis all year round, and that part of the community is growing as well. So yes, it's pretty busy in, in season, uh, but that season is getting stretched out longer and longer as we, as we go forward. Um, so when you're here six or eight months and you both, <coughs> partner, both partners love to play the golf and you play three, let's say three times a week, um, that's like 25 times a month times eight, 200 rounds of golf for $1,280 plus the golf cart, that's a heck of a deal. Now your neighbor who's from up north coming in just for three months and he's on a tennis court and the lady wants to golf, she only plays 25 rounds. That family also pays $1,280. Um, the 250 families, the 20% that do not play golf, also pay that. That's the bundled community. We're all in this uh, together. So um, everybody is contrib contributing to making sure that our biggest amenity is in top shape um, for a big amount, bigger than what any of us will ever pay for any other amenity. So that's a good insight to, to keep in mind. Um, second amenity is our food and beverage, $600. The shuttle, number three, $235. Um, and then the, the amenities where there's a lot of talk about, about pickleball and tennis and, and fitness. Uh, well, tennis is, not, tennis is not even half of what we pay for the shuttle. Um, these numbers are getting marginally small because there are hardly any operating costs. Uh, fitness and bocce and pickleball, all rounding errors here. Basically, when you add it all up and you look, the big chunk that we pay for is the restaurants and the golf course. These are the two big ticket items, and that's not going to change anytime soon. So it's going to be there uh, going forward. Um, so as Pelican Sound, we know that we have a unique and premium location. Uh, it makes us different from other communities. Uh, we want to enhance that going forward. Um, yes, we have increased the range of amenities over the last couple of years. Uh, it's good so because that's the kind of request from the membership. Um, some of them are really good, but some of them are not really up to par when we compare ourselves with current alternatives in the marketplace. So our clubhouse is getting somewhat tired uh, and our racket sports um, are below standard. Pickleball we don't really want to show because they don't compare to pickleball infrastructure that you have in various other communities. Um, and we play against over 30 different other communities when it comes down to tennis. Um, and our infrastructure is definitely below par any of the 30 that we go and play on. So we need to address that uh, going forward at some point in time. Uh, we do have a very active lifestyle, uh, very busy. Uh, once an owner, you have access to everything. It's not always the case. Let's go to the, to the Brooks, uh, you say Spring Run or Copper Leaf or any of, of those communities. Um, yes, they pay an annual fee for their base package, but if you want to get access to the better restaurant that they have, you want to get access to the better fitness center that they have, you want to get access to the learning center that they have, you pay an extra entry fee one time, $3,500. And every year you pay for the second tier le level another $1,400 on top of your annual dues. So when you add and compare apples and oranges and how all these clubs charge their memberships in different ways, we, we have a pretty compelling package and we really choose to make sure everyone has access to everything. We don't want to have second and third tier level memberships. Uh, last but not least, uh, power of scale. When at the end of the year we need to divide some bills by 1299, we're definitely in a better spot than if, than if you live in a community where it's only 800 or 700 or 600 homes. Uh, so just dividing by more doors, more people, is really something that helps uh, all of us. Uh, it's a competitive benefit and we need to leverage that um, going forward. 
Um, we compared ourselves to uh, those two communities that I talked about. Um, we double checked the actual real estate transactions, every single one of them, in 2016 here at Pelican Sound and in those two communities. Um, I think compared, combined it's like over 180 sales transactions. And we compared the, the unit pr uh, the price for that, and the conclusion is that overall, there's a 25% premium in our community for the same square footage than if you would compare uh, your units with the similar units in those two communities. So people are perceiving that there's an added value, a premium value to Pelican Sound, and it translates itself in what we can ask for the properties that we have. Um, so then people look at that, they're expecting then also that they can experience that premium infrastructure that we are promising to, to have. And all of that is driven by a lot of the investments that we made into the community, and we're pretty confident that what you will see today is going to be another two good solid reasons to believe that we are that preferred choice, should be that preferred choice in the marketplace, and that's really good to enhance and sustain and protect uh, the, our, our home equity values that we, that we have. Um, so continuously looking forward and investing, uh, standing still, as I mentioned, is not really a good option. We need to go uh, forward. Um, and, it, and that's also the reality of the last four or five years. There are a, a number of sales that took place, a little bit more than in the past before that. Um, we almost had 400 units sold over the last four years, so we're averaging around 100 units per year now. But that's about almost close to 30% of our entire community that changed ownership hands in four years. So when you look around in the different neighborhoods where you are, you might discover more new faces than you ever thought about. Um, and most likely that trend is not, is not going to slow down. Uh, you need to look at, at that number in perspective of so um, the demographic. Um, when you look at the average age of our community, it has been going up from 64-ish, four or five years ago, to now 68-ish. Um, and that's just pure mathematical. Five years ago, we were all five years younger, uh, and we just do plus tick plus one every year. Um, and going forward, it's going to be the same thing. So whatever we do about it, there's nothing we can do about it. That's the, that's the reality of our community. We adjust to that. Um, we just need to be conscious and make sure that we can adjust for our membership what we do. Um, now, when you look at the, some of the sub-numbers, an interesting number I wanted to quote is like the group of people that are now 75 and older is 20% of our community. You would never guess when you see how active we are and how people participate both in golf and even me, the younger kid, are, is played off the courts by people who are older than 75. It's amazing. Um, but that is, was only 6% five years ago. So it clearly shows that collectively this community has shifted somewhat in, in, in age group. Um, and that is actually only the key reason why we say it's very unlikely that we're going to see the number of sales transactions slow down. As the community gets older, most likely we'll expect that that number will be more or less the same, if not potentially higher. Uh, the key question is, we want to make sure that whenever people decide that it's time to leave the community, that, we, that they can get the maximum value for their properties. But that's good for them, and it's good for the members that stay. Um, the key question is, who's going to be that future buyer? And over the last five years, we've been relatively uh, lucky uh, in the sense that we had a relatively big group inside Pelican Sound, renters and people that wanted to upgrade, <coughs> move up in the community most of the time, and move from neighborhood to neighborhood. Um, of the hundred sales per year on average, 60 of them were to people that were in Pelican Sound. So people that are really happy with the community, they know what they get, they have their friendships, and they want to stay. The best testimonial we can have. Um, flip side of the coin is there's only 40 of the 100 that are actually new to Pelican Sound. So these people really have to be young. 55 or younger to slow down any of us getting one year older every year. So, um, so hopefully, when, whenever in the future looking forward, we, whenever we get new buyers in, we hope that they, they are younger so they can help balance out the, the entire community. 
Um, but again, the key message is, as we most likely will, we're going to flip from primary buying op opportunities from within the community, we'll see a need for having and finding buyers coming out from outside the community as potential buyers for whenever we want to sell uh, any of our properties. But that has as an implication that they will compare us with other alternatives more than they have done so far. So we need to really make sure that whatever we choose to do going forwards in terms of priorities, that we make sure that we have a very compelling package, not only for our own membership, but also to make sure that we can attract that group of future prospective buyers that we need to attract to provide a solution for all of us going forward. Um, so one standard high quality level within Pelican Sound is kind of a key thing that we need to look at. Uh, we are not the only community looking at capital projects uh, on an ongoing basis. Actually, at this point in time, they have McGladry is the biggest consultant accounting firm who specialized in hospitality communities. Um, the investments have never been as high as right now. So over 40% of uh, communities are actively doing capital projects because they realize that they have been losing members or their current members are asking for, can we also get these new amenities that other clubs now have? So the large majority of clubs have to do something to make sure that, that they can stay current in order to retain their memberships. Um, and when they do so, the big trends in the market is that over a period of 20 years, many of these communities started with one big amenity. Um, for many of us, golf, but some other clubs have like yachts uh, or something else. And all, all of them have been adding a various a variety of amenities. So that we're all moving into a direction of resort style living uh, with more options for members um, to choose from. And the two big trends are actually more exercise, more fitness, more wellness, doing things, being active, don't sit on the couch and watch TV, go out and be, be active. Secondly, um, the one big formal clubhouse and the one menu for the whole season, that's uh, no longer the preferred option. People want more variety, more choice. It's just like the cruise ship business uh, 20 years ago. It's a big cruise ship, 2,000 people go to the restaurant. Uh, now, the big restaurant is a little bit smaller, and they have four or five specialty restaurants as additional options and choices for their guests. Well, it's very similar what's happening in our industry, uh, in many communities, and that's also one of the concepts that you will see reflected in what Jim is gonna present. Um, so, a lot of things, things are going really well for us, but there are some weaker spots that we need to take into account and, and, and make sure that we address those at some point in time. Uh, so our clubhouse getting a little bit tired. Um, more and more owners have their own golf cart uh, than before. Uh, so it's really getting really busy uh, around the staging area and the golf infrastructure. So we try to streamline that and improve that for our golfers. Um, we mentioned pickleball cannot stay where it is today and we want to, would like to put it in a place where the realtors who are avoiding it today or can't get it, that they can showcase that to new potential buyers because they're looking for these kind of amenities and that's going to help for the values of our homes. Um, the tennis at the same time we, we should uh, bring the tennis courts up to standard with all the clubs um, and as mentioned, we're going to have to free up space so that this can really a true fitness center um, going forward. Uh, these are the themes and you, you will see that reflected in the concepts that uh, Jim is going to present. It's all around how we develop the golf complex in different ways and it's all around how we can broaden the scope of any activity except golf all around the river, with the, the river club here and how we might uh, do that going forward. So now the nicer pictures are going to come. <laughs> Thank you everyone for coming out this morning. Um, some may wonder how we got sort of where we are today. Uh, you obviously heard the strategic perspective, but there also is a um, perspective on just a efficiency and an upgrade perspective too. Uh, the golf club was actually uh, scheduled in 2016. 
to go through a, a facelift, which was basically just replacing furniture and carpet. Uh, we had about $900,000 in the budget to do that. Uh, when we started looking at actually getting some quotes on just doing that, the number ended up being about a 1.5 million. Um, and we said, wow, that just seems like a lot of money just to uh, change some paint and change some carpet. Um, the House of Social and the board sort of had us relook at it again. Uh, we looked at some other options to maybe improve uh, the logistics of uh, how the setup is and maybe move some walls around and change the footprint a little bit. That number came in obviously <coughs> a lot higher, at like two and a half million. Uh, anyone who's been in the community uh, quite a few years uh, will realize that we've already went through one major renovation of the golf club in like 2006, uh, where we spent around $2 million at that time to do that facelift. Um, and during that facelift, we added about, there was about 50 seats added uh, around in the grill room area. Um, and th since that time, we've added about 70 seats on the exterior, on the outdoor dining. So basically, we've added about 50% capacity to the golf club from the time it was uh, first built. Um, and through this whole process over the years now, uh, 17 years through, uh, no real upgrade to the kitchens happened at all. So we've uh, increased the capacity of the, uh, of the uh, golf club by 50% and done nothing in the, uh, in the kitchen. To put uh, that in perspective of the, of the kitchen, efficiency uh, at the river club with the newer kitchen newer facility uh, we average around 300 to 500 covers uh, on a given night thursday night being the most uh, uh, highest volume night where we do four to five hundred almost every thursday uh, with that we do that with about four we do that with four people in the kitchen at the river club uh, at the golf club on a typical friday evening uh, we'll do 80 say in the grill room maybe 120 140 in the dining room and it takes us eight people to do that because the kitchen uh, at the golf club is a double line system. It has a front line and a back line. So we have, we have half the people working on the front and half the people working on the back, depending what the menu item is. One's being made on one side, one being made on the other side, and then loops back to the front and then goes out the door. So we're basically doing 40% uh, of the volume we do in the river club, and we're doing it with double the labor. So. Um, when you look at the F&B um, subsidy uh, that we talked about, about a $600 subsidy, um, about 80% of that is related to the golf club as opposed to the river club, which does fairly well from a financial perspective. So we want to look at this as a clean slate and say, in a perfect world, what can we do to both improve efficiency and then also add additional options for people uh, for dining options. So uh, we'll go over the golf club complex first. And basically what we end up having to do here is uh, because we had to do some additional work in the kitchen, we added about 400 square feet of space to the kitchen. Uh, and to do that, we basically had to take over the administration offices where my office currently is located, then also build out towards the main dining room and push that wall out of the kitchen towards the main dining room. So in this plan, we are basically um, moving uh, towards the lobby of the kitchen and also moving the main dining room uh, out towards um, lakes number nine, or basically the area now that's uh, in currently the overhang where we have outdoor tables, that now gets enclosed so we can pick up the seating that we needed by expanding the kitchen. To pick up the outdoor space that we used to have behind uh, the uh, main dining room, we're adding some covered seating uh, behind the grill room. Uh, we're adding uh, the pavilion or replacing that as the outdoor grill space. Uh, we're going to uh, reuse the golf shop space as another alternative for food and beverage option. We're calling it the cafe, but we'll go into that in a little bit. And all that then necessitated having a secondary building or adjacent building to handle the golf shop, uh, administration, and multi-purpose rooms so that when this space we believe will be continued to be used and increased for food and, or, uh, for fitness, it allows us to have the multi-purpose rooms up at the golf club <coughs> for that purpose. Uh, we would redesign and reshape the staging area and remove the old metal barn building we have within the facility and replace that with a permanent, more permanent type structure for the car barn, which allows us to get the more, more parking and some other green space around the golf club complex. When we see what that would look like from a front view, uh, in 1999 through 2005, basically all the uh, surrounding communities in Southwest Florida were all built with a heavy uh, Mediterranean architectural theme. Um, any of the new facilities that are being built or any of the other uh, communities that went through a major renovation, they're all pretty much un-Mediterraneanized the, uh, the facilities. That's just a trend. A Mediterranean theme is sort of outdated at this point. Just look at your Clive Daniel or your Robin Suckey commercials and you'll see that. Um, so uh, 
But the one thing up here, unlike the River Club, uh, where we're sort of separated from all the other neighborhoods where we get, we can have a little more freedom, up here we have to make sure that we still stay somewhat consistent and have some Mediterranean uh, theme because we still have the residential neighborhoods that surround the golf club complex. So we're, we're doing a quasi uh, theme here of old and new. When we look at sort of what the historical things we were doing, we were spending, like uh, I mentioned, two million dollars or so every eight, ten years to basically just uh, reface the building um, and not improve any functionality whatsoever. Uh, we didn't think that was a really good, appropriate uh, way to go about business. So it's either one of those things that's like your house. You got to decide at some point, are we going to just keep doing that? Or are we going to make a major improvement? Or are we just going to leave it the way it is and live life? Uh, we don't think that's a good option either. So we're looking at trying to create space that's not only good for 2018 or 19, but 2020 and beyond. Um, to do that, we want to uh, maximize and create our newest F&B dining industry standards that Luke talked about from a strategic standpoint. That will allow us to create multiple dining options, uh, do a more open floor plan, open concept bar and outdoor patio dining, uh, create a, another alternative uh, cafe and grill and pub uh, area make everything brighter and more contemporary, obviously. Uh, go from a formal perspective to a classic casual. Uh, whether we like it or not, the world of formality has disappeared and is going further and further away. Um, I remember the days growing up that my dad made me go to the club with them for dinner and I had to put on my pants and my jacket on Friday night to go to dinner. Those days are gone. There was one restaurant in Naples, for anyone who's lived in Naples for 25 years or more like I have, there's a restaurant called the uh, St. George and the Dragon down in Naples. They're the only restaurant in town that required you to wear a jacket if you went to, the, went to that restaurant. About three years they closed, about three years ago. Not sure there was a coincidence there, but I think there might have been. Um, what this allowed, they did change the policy. In the bar area, you could, you could not wear you could not wear a jacket in a bar, that is true. Uh, but in the restaurant part, you had to still wear one. Um, so all this uh, functionality of the golf club also allows us to uh, create some more uh, a secondary building with the golf shop, create some better logistics from a, a traffic flow perspective. Then as we talked about adding the additional parking and meeting room infrastructure up here that we know we'll need uh, here in the near term as fitness and wellness continues to grow. So when we look at the, um, the floor plan of the golf club, what we basically are talked about already is a kitchen where we want to expand it a little bit. So we moved out towards the offices and we moved to the main dining room. But then what we're doing is also converting what now is the um, outdoor grill where you have the grill down over here, but then you also have the snack bar facility here that has some uh, kitchen facility. We're expanding that kitchen as well, making this more of a full service kitchen. So it ends up being an auxiliary type kitchen uh, for the overall clubhouse, which allows us now to have functions going on in the main dining room out of this kitchen and maybe even the grill room or if there's things in both of these rooms, we could still have this kitchen available for this other space we've created here. So we can have multiple things going on at one time. You know, the, the scenario of people saying, well, we're gonna open two nights for dinner. That is true, but most nights we're doing something else. Uh, like last night we had an event, we have a different event next week with neighborhoods. So there's usually something going on, but when we have an event going on, like last night there was a Pinehurst going away party, I believe, with over 100 and something people, that then <laughs> limits uh, us to where we where have to serve everything out of the one kitchen. So going uh, some circularing around, this would be a front view. You can see how we've removed the dormers. We've created more of a straight line and transitional look um, so that we get, uh, and we've taken all these multiple columns that were there before and just kept the structural columns and squared them off so that it looks more contemporary. Uh, the lobby space basically stays uh, uh, the same size, but what we would do is we'd be vaulting the ceiling. Right now it's got a real low ceiling. We're gonna vault the ceiling create a nice feature with a, a, a chandelier uh, and some other um, light artwork and so forth to make this more of a, a wow factor and a more light factor when you come in. It's real dark when you come in currently. Oops, sorry. Um, the other thing you're gonna notice on here, uh, I just actually missed one, you'll see there's where there's one multi-purpose room here. Uh, that's basically reconfiguring sort of the ladies lounge that we currently have off the ladies locker room. Uh, and we've added one in this room that we'll go over. But basically we've added about four or five multi-purpose rooms that can handle anywhere from eight to 20 people. Uh, right now, basically the only rooms we have for that are these rooms up here. Obviously we're gonna potentially lose some of these. But a lot of times these rooms up here are also um, being used only by 12 or 16 people. Either there's a meeting, like a committee meeting, or there's a group of people playing cards or mahjong. 
and there's only 12 or 16 of them, they're using a room this size. Uh, which doesn't make much sense. We want to create more uh, smaller rooms that can accommodate those people and free up the meeting room space we have for meetings such as this. So we're going to go around sort of counterclockwise of what the clubhouse would look like from the back side just because it's an easier flow of, of seeing how it flows. And we're uh, looking at con converting the uh, pro shop to what we're going to call the hub or central hub. And this is basically a, a social gathering spot for both morning breakfast and lunch type items. But it's also an area you'll see on most mornings now, you have people that are walking around the community. Most of them stop around the golf clubs. Some sit around the outdoor grill tables. Some sit behind the main dining room tables. We're trying to create this space now uh, from an outdoor and indoor perspective of um, how this space could be used for that type of socialization. Um, and we created another multi-purpose room here as well. But if you think of this space as sort of the Starbucks Panera, Panera type of feel, that's sort of what this space would be used for. So you could have your light breakfast type sandwiches, your pastries, your coffees uh, during the morning time, convert over to soup, soup sandwich salads in the uh, afternoon, and then convert over to a, a more bistro style uh, option in the evening. Um, and so don't worry about the picture. We are still get, we'll still give you the free coffee like we, we always do. <laughs> but we will start potentially charging you for an espresso or cappuccino or some other uh, uh, high-end coffee that you may want. So we'll maybe make some incremental income with that. Uh, we'll switch over to the grill, or now what we're calling the Pelican Pub. And you'll see another multi-purpose room that we've increased, that we've added in here. Uh, we reconfigured the space, moving the bar to a central bar location, creating an outdoor indoor bar. Uh, similar in size with the number of people, about 88 people can fit in this space. But we added the outdoor covered dining, which is about 70 people as well. This would have your, uh, your uh, retractable doors like we have here at the River Club, so all this opens up into one big room, part of it being indoors, part of it being outdoors. And you'll see how it also shares the same kitchen that we'll be using for the cafe. And as we go to the next slides, we'll show you how the uh, pavilion areas share the same kitchen as well. So you have three areas that are sharing the kitchen. Um, so this basically ends up serving about 160 people uh, during a, a lunch and or dinner option. And you'd obviously have your lunch menu and your dinner options here at the, uh, at the grill. And it would look something like this from the back side as you're driving around here over to lakes number one. Uh, this would be your new outdoor seating for the uh, grill. And that sort of flows into what we're going to go over next, which is a pavilion area uh, for the outdoor grill. So the pavilion bar and grill is basically a nice term for outdoor grill. Uh, we basically have created a permanent covered structure. So we have some tables under cover and some exterior like we currently have with the uh, cantilever umbrellas. Uh, we would have a central focal feature in here. This is a fire, a four-sided fireplace. Um, and the concept here is totally an open kitchen concept from the pavilion to be able to see in as the food is being prepared. Uh, and you can see now the pink area, which is a cafe, and this orange area over here, which is a grill, how they all can share the same kitchen. So you can have multiple things going on at the same time or have a function going on over in the main dining room and still service all these other three areas. Um, so. Uh, basically this brings our current outdoor grill area up to code. Our current grill is not near code at all um, and we have to do that here sooner or later. And this is what it would look like from the back perspective. And now you can start seeing how all these sort of flow from one to the other. This is the outdoor seating of the cafe which flows to the pavilion which then flows out to uh, the grill room. So as any of these spaces start overflowing or filling up you can move from one to another. Obviously all being worked out of the same <coughs> kitchen with three different menu options. Uh, from the main dining room perspective, even though we did move out the kitchen, some of that space, by moving it out and covering that area that's currently uh, over the overhang and also taking that little corner over there by the water side room that's currently behind the water side room and enclosing all that, uh, we were able to add about 50 seats uh, to the main dining room. Um, and we were able to increase the dance floor size, create more storage, and then uh, put in these uh, operable nano doors that, that uh, fully uh, open up. And then we would peak the roof so we'd be able to add the additional uh, windows within the main dining room space. This building faces south. Uh, so by adding that extra glass, we get a lot more light into this building and brighten up. Um, and we're not putting an overhang on this side of the building uh, so that we will be able to generate as much natural light into this room as possible. Uh, from the back side, it would look something like this. 
Um, we would have this showing how the door is being opened, uh, bringing the out doors to the inside. And we'd be creating these different pockets of uh, social gathering spot we call pods, like each with their own little uh, fire pit. Uh, anywhere from eight to four to eight to 12 people can fit in these different pods. And we'd have a separate menu available out here, tapas type menu or small plate menu. And um, looking like that, and it would look something like this from the back. Again, you can see how all these areas flow from one spot to the other. From the perspective now, of how do we pick up the space for what we took out of the main club? We would be looking at building an adjacent building, uh, which would accommodate the golf pro shop and have the covered walkway between the two to connect them. We have the men's and ladies rooms, uh, the golf shop, uh, some storage rooms, office, a fitting room, all here on the first floor. And what that allows us is to put on the second floor, we'd be able to take all the administration office space we lost uh, in the golf club, also take the people that are currently over by the tennis uh, courts in the metal building, bring them all up to one location and have all administration located on the second floor. And it also allow us to add uh, under the same footprint from below, a multi-purpose room that can accommodate approximately 120 people, uh, 60 people on each side, or 120 when it's open fully, which is basically about two-thirds of the size of what this upstairs here in the fitness center is. And that would look something like this from the back view. A little area here, this would be your coffee and water station for the golfers before teeing off. And you can see here how it starts overflowing now over to where we're creating the new staging area for the golf operation. Uh, this diagram basically shows what a shotgun start would look like. This is 85 golf carts lined up for a shotgun start. So you can do all that without being on the driving range. We create this new covered area for the bag drop. Uh, we build a new cart barn here. And this is uh, from an aerial perspective, you can see how big the size of this area is for the staging area. So when you don't have a shotgun start, there's all types of extra parking here. Uh, we don't have it on diagram, but we have plenty of rooms here to add additional parking for private golf carts here on the back side of the clubhouse. And now this shows totally from the aerial how you can now add the additional parking over here and keep this green space available for outdoor venues uh, such as our concerts in the park that we currently have. So that's sort of a quick overview of the golf club. When we get to uh, the racket center, which is back here by, behind us at the Corson property, um, we're looking at putting the eight tennis courts and the eight pickleball courts together. Um, pickleball being over here, that's why it's got the different screening, because it's got the acoustical screening around the courts. Your covered area for viewing there, a covered area for viewing behind uh, here for the tennis. This is about a 2,000 square foot facility. And you're looking at it from the front view here. Um, from a floor plan perspective, uh, you basically have the pro shop here, um, another uh, multi-purpose room, some storage. Uh, you have your men's and ladies restrooms, and then you have basically a, a kitchenette or warming kitchen. So if you do have an event going on at the racket center, you can bring, bring in the food from the river club, keep it cold or hot until the event uh, starts. And this also creates a secondary use, just like we currently use on Monday nights at the river club, where the neighborhoods or golf groups use a river club on Monday nights, uh, we could have this available as well. Uh, looking like that from the back view. Another back view uh, perspective just showing that how it faces west, the courts are north to south, obviously. Uh, and this is what the overhead would look like from um, where the, how the courts, everything would be positioned. You'd have your eight tennis courts in here, your eight pickleball courts in here. You'd now create the additional parking uh, for the River Club and Racket Center and connect that road all the way through down to the Island South Boulevard. So it created a connection. And you can see even um, with where we position the courts, there's still a lot of natural buffering in here between where the courts are and where the neighborhoods are. Um, and we could enhance that landscape as well. Uh, from pickleball, the obviously elephant in the room pickleball is a noise factor. Uh, luckily, we're not the only community that has pickleball. Many communities have put pickleball in many years ago, so they've had a, a learning curve over the years, and they're, uh, they've learned a lot on how to mitigate noise. Uh, the biggest advantage that they've used is any type of landscape buffer is your best first defense. Then you have the special fencing, the acoustical screening you can use, uh, the awning option. Uh, manufacturers are already are dealing with that when they have better um, uh, paddles and better ball that are a little more quiet. They continue to work on that. And we would not be lighting the pickleball courts. It would be a daytime sport, 9 a.m. to dusk only on pickleball, but we're, we need to be as proactive as possible to mitigate as much noise as possible when it comes to uh, pickleball. 
So we really think this is the best land use uh, for, um, for all the purposes that we're looking to try to, uh, to grow here in the community. Um, this area would become a, a showcase, we think, for uh, the community and be something that no other community could really have the ability to do, because most of them don't even have the land uh, to do it. Uh, we were fortunate that WCI couldn't make a deal with the uh, person who owned that property during development days. Um, after development, that, pro that land was available. Uh, the, the community, when it turned over, looked at um, buying it from the owner and they wanted like $680,000 for it. Um, we luckily had some cash around when the recession hit um, and we offered them 250 grand and that's when we picked up this piece of property, four and a half acres, about four years ago, five years ago now. So obviously, what does it all come down to when it, when it comes down to money? Uh, my job was to do the design and come up with some figures. Uh, Keith will go over how potentially it could be financed, but basically looking at an eight to $10 million project with the golf club being uh, seven, five to $7 million of it for all the things we talked about and a sports complex being uh, three million, but also realizing that, uh, that since course and property is a raw piece of land, um, there's about a million dollars of infrastructure that has to go into that land to get it to where you can develop it, whether it's a racket center or something else, you got a million dollar cost to develop it first. From an operating cost perspective, um, this is always one of the things that's talked about. Um, just like the River Club, there was concern when we built the River Club that you know it's going to be much bigger, you need more people. Uh, but those are both true. It is bigger and we have a lot more people working. On a Thursday night we have 27 people working. But we're also doing 500 people. Uh, so the reality is the River Club now, new River Club compared to the old River Club, actually financially does better than the old River Club. Um, when it comes to the uh, racket sports, uh, right now we have technically six pickleball courts. We have the two down here and the four in the back side there. Uh, so we already have six we're maintaining. We're adding two. That's not a huge scenario. And then on the tennis courts, we're obviously maintaining six courts. Now we'd be maintaining eight. Uh, but because the courts that we currently have are the above ground irrigation courts, um, uh, we spend a lot of money on clay every year because most a lot of clay gets uh, washed off the courts. When you have the hydro system, uh, that does not happen. So there'll be minimal costs of the main maintenance on the, uh, on the courts. So over the years, in 2004 to 2017, uh, if you think about all the amenities and capital costs that have went through this community um, over those 14 years, the reality is your operating assessments went up on average 4% a year. Um, and out of that 4% a year on average, 2% um, of that or half of that is directly related to labor costs. Uh, our budget here is $11 million budget for 2017. 5.6 million of that is labor. Um, so when you have a 2% or 3% cost of living increase in labor, that's adding 2% to your budget basically because it's half your budget. Um, you know, unless we get to a point where you have little robots delivering your, uh, your drinks or you GPS into a piece of lawnmower equipment to go out there and mow everything without having a body on it, those costs aren't gonna disappear. Right? So we can't, we gotta be honest and say those, those costs are not gonna go away. So uh, uh, it is what it is when it comes to labor. So with that, we really feel strategically in operation, this is a very good option of where we can go forward from here. And we think it's something that will allow the uh, majority of the owners here to enjoy it while they're here, and obviously be a nice attraction for a potential new buyer down the road. So with that, I'll turn it over to Keith, who can go over the uh, financial uh, perspective of the project. Okay, thank you, Jim. Well, Luke talked about our strategic plan and how this project fits into that and our future. And of course, Jim went through the project. And now I want to talk about how we would potentially pay for this. So if we look at this pie and just consider the project to be a $10 million project, it makes the math a little bit easier. 15% of that would be from our replacement funds. As Jim mentioned, or Luke mentioned, every year in our dues, we pay about $850 for replacement of chairs, tables, air conditioners, roofs, and so forth. So if we look at that fund designated specifically for the golf club and tennis operations, uh, they're sitting there about a million and a half dollars specifically for those facilities. So we can use those funds uh, as we upgrade this, those facilities. $3 million or 30% can come from resale. Every time we sell a unit, we collect $6,500. $6, $6, $6, $6, $6, $6, $6, $6, $6, 
and those funds are specifically available for new construction, new amenities. And so we're looking at that fund and we're pulling out three or earmarking $3 million of that fund for this project. And that's, oh dear. Um, $5.5 million then to make up the difference would, would have to come from a loan. So the new loan uh, would be paid off $750 per year uh, for seven years. So we would pay off the current debt first. We have two more payments left, December of this year and December of next year. And then there would be seven more years of $750. So we're adding no new debt, but we are extending debt going forward. So it would be five to seven years. If it's $10 million, it would be the seven years. So we're looking at a $5.7 million loan. So between the three funds, the replacement capital, the uh, resale funds, and the loan, we could generate up to $10 million in capital. So there's really no change in affordability of what we're paying today, uh, but we would be extending the payments another seven years. As Jim mentioned, and I don't want people to walk away and say there'd be no future increases, we do have cost of living allowances and so forth. Those continue, but as far as the debt to pay for this project and the current projects, that would continue at the same level we're paying today. That's $2 a day when you stop and think about it. So uh, take $2 out of your pocket every day and put it in the cookie jar and you got it covered. <laughs> so uh, it is very affordable when you really look at what all we're getting. We're still retaining 25% of the capital uh, resale uh, for other projects. Uh, we're not consuming the total resale capital fund. We're pushing around, pushing almost 100 homes per year. In this plan, we're only figuring 75 homes and we're only taking 75% of that for this project. So there is a, definitely a cushion in there if sales should drop for some reason. But as you saw the demographics, we truly believe that it's gonna continue on as we age. So what is the timetable? What do we do from here? Well, first of all, we potentially can make project adjustments based on town hall input. Uh, we've had meetings all last week. We'll finish up this week on Friday. Our ad hoc committee has uh, been attending these meetings. They're taking down your comments. Uh, the surveys that we've been getting and the survey that you'll do afterwards, uh, uh, we're taking that data. The ad hoc committee will pull all that together next week and see if there's any tweaking they think needs to be done if, based on comments and so forth and bring to the board then their recommendation. Do we keep the project as is or should we change this or that? So that's the next step in the process. The board then meets on April the 27th to listen to the ad hoc committee and Jim's recommendation on where to go to from here. If we continue to get the positive feedback that we've been receiving, uh, the board then would vote or give Jim some additional funding for detail specs permitting. And also at that meeting, we'll discuss when do we need to take this to a vote. We will not put the first shovel in the ground until uh, all of us, we owners, vote on this project. So assuming it does get a positive uh, input and the board wants to continue then Jim of course would spend the next three to nine months pulling together details of the project specifications bidding and doing the usual things you do with these type projects <coughs> excuse me again based on the input from the ad hoc committee do we want to vote soon do we want to vote later uh, do we think that we need more town hall meetings, brochures, frequently asked question, question distribution, a lot of the stuff that we did for this facility. But our commitment is that we'll vote on this no later than November. Uh, I've been on the board for six years. Uh, we've talked about these projects on and off, maybe doing tennis, maybe doing the club. You know, the golf club is continues to deteriorate. Uh, pickleball has got to be moved. If, 
Florida Power and Light ever discovers it, we're in deep trouble. Uh, it's got to go. Uh, the grill is, is, doesn't meet standards and on and on and on. And so we kept looking at these things and do we go just do this project or that? We're a bundled community and we really ought to vote it on, on it as a bundle. So it's one project that, that uh, Jim presented to you and we definitely are committed to go or no go by November of this year. So assuming if we do go forward with it and we get a positive vote from you all, the Racket Center could open as early as 2018. The land is available. You could start construction any minute on it. Uh, it's sitting there with current tennis and racquetball would not be affected when the new center is open and those facilities could be closed, the old facilities. And the clubhouse, we could open as early as January of 2019. We would have to close it in April of 2018, just as we did this facility, so it would be closed from April to January. The question comes up, how can we move that fast? A uh, <clears throat> couple things. Uh, first of all, we wouldn't do anything until we get owner approval on this project, but once we do, we know that we can have the authority to take out a loan. So in the meantime, until we take out the loan two years from now, uh, we could use our internal funds that we have. We've accumulated a lot of funds for replacement and uh, capital or resale dollars. So we could borrow against ourselves and proceed forward. And also we have a construction loan built into these numbers. So we could move that fast. Uh, it doesn't mean we'll necessarily do that, but that is the potential that this project would have. Again, we're looking for owner input and thoughts on this whole thing. So that's the end of the formal presentation.